Hi, welcome back. In our last video, we were talking about root finding using methods known as bracketing methods, which required two input values. And we talked about some of the difficulties that we had when using those methods and some of the problems that can occur. In this video, we're going to talk about something called open methods, which only require one input value. And hopefully will help us come up with a procedure to be able to utilize that. And so I'm going to show you how to do that in this video. So without further ado, let's get started. So as we talked about in the last video, there are lots of different ways to find roots of polynomials. Um, different algorithms that all have their advantages and disadvantages. Some converge faster, some are guaranteed to converge, and so on and so forth. In this video, we're going to step into a different classification known as non-bracketing methods or the open methods. Okay, And the advantage that happens with these is that we require only a single value of x. Okay, or maybe even two values that don't necessarily bracket the root. And by bracketing the root, we mean occurring on such that one, root, uh, one value is on one side of the root and the other is on the other. Okay, the, now we want a methodology that will allow us to take two just initial guesses and use those to be able to predict you know, a root, even if it doesn't bracket it, so to say. All right, so the basic technique that is involved in all of these methods is that we're going to start off with an initial guess that we're going to call as x naught. Okay, that's our first guess. And all of these routines that we're going to show you are going to use that x naught value to achieve the next guess. And if I do that, then I now have a methodology for being able to, to start to kind of work my way through through this. Alright, so the simplest form of this is the following, that if we recast our function that we're looking for such that it, you know, f of x is equal to zero, so that it has a single value x on the left hand side, okay, we can rearrange that polynomial <coughs> such that now we have something that looks like, you know, if zero is equal to f of x, that x is equal to f of x plus x. Okay, and so what happens is, is we're going to call this side as kind of our new quasi formula that we're going to kind of tweak and change and modify. Okay, so the idea is, is that <coughs> if x1 is the root of this equation, then f of x1 is equal to zero. Okay, which means then that my x of xi plus one, which is my next guess, so you know x, I said x1, it should be xi here. Then the next guess, which we call as xi plus one, okay, should be equal to xi. All right, and so if we if if we find the root and you know, we iterate through until this value doesn't change much, then we know that we found it. Okay, this is what we call the convergence criteria that we talked about in the last one. Okay, and another way of looking at that is this you know approximation and error calculation that we've seen a couple of times now in our previous videos where we basically set some sort of tolerance on this, you know, maybe it's 0.1% or it's 0.001 on the decimal or whatever the case may be, that that we can do this calculation and this is how you can algorithmically stop a calculation if you're using a spreadsheet or a macro or something to iterate through. All right, so that's kind of where we're going with all this and kind of the basics. All right, so let's talk a little bit about some of these, these basic open methods. So we define that function, you know, or a little, let me see if I can clean that up a little bit. All right, sorry about that. Hopefully that'll improve a little bit. So what we have is we have our next guess, this xi plus one value, which we said was going to be equal to g of xi. So what I'm doing is I'm plugging into that function that we call g of x, which was our guess in the arrangement that we had before, okay, in which I substitute the value of xi, which was my, previ my, my previous guess, into the equation to produce x of i plus one. Okay, because we define g of xi as being f of xi plus xi. Okay, so here's the, uh, the general idea. So if we go through and we do this process, okay, if we find that f of xi is greater than zero, then we want to move f of xi to the right. Okay, okay, and then if we plug in, if f of xi is less than zero, then we move to the left. Okay, because the difference is, on this when we plug in, if it's a negative value, if this was my first guess, then it moves to the left because this value is negative. Okay, and likewise, up here it moved to the right because here was my first guess, 
and here's my second, the approximation that comes out of my calculation, if f of xi is positive, it will move me to the right. Now, right off the bat, you start to see one of the problems that we have with this particular method. All right, so let's consider, you know, kind of our, you know, our, our convergence case for a function that looks something kind of like this. Generally speaking, this function has a negative slope. All right, and so what will happen is, is if we start off with our first guess on this, you know, or sorry, of x naught over here, you know, and I come through, then my f of x is less than zero, which means that my next guess will move to the right. And then if I come down again, my f of x is still less than zero, it's something to the right. And now this function, now it's a little bit less than x sub zero, we will move to the calculation here. So that's with an, x, an, an initial guess that is over here on the high side in which I have a negative function. Okay. So if we do this, then, and eventually you can see that we're drifting from x0 to x1 to x2, and we're generally trending to the left, okay, which means I am moving toward the root. Okay, so, okay, that works pretty well. Now let's try another guess for an initial value. So all of these require a guess for, to, to get the routine started. So if I start here with this value, and now my function is a positive value, we said that when it's a positive value, we'll move to the right. And so this will be my first guess, and so it's going to move us some amount to the right. You know, and if I end up here, I'm still positive, I keep moving to the right. If I jump too far over here, I'm now negative, it will pull me back, and this thing will start to oscillate its way in, and it will converge onto this root eventually. Okay, so that's kind of the, the nature of what we're hoping will happen. And so if we look at, you know, if my guess is too low, we move to the right. If my guess was too high, we move to the left. And if the tru truth is somewhere in the middle where the root is, then that's convergence. That's what we mean by convergence, that it's tending toward this value regardless of what happens. Okay, and so what happens in this is this is said to have um, an approximately linear convergence rate. Okay, everything is based off of that variable of x. Okay, and that looks like a pretty good guess, but now let's try a different function. Okay, but what if we have two roots on this? Okay, so we're going to start with a case, and again, this is just some arbitrary function that maybe it has two roots that looks like this. It's possible that I could take a guess of x1 that's reasonably close to the root, you know, and I could go to here, and then what would happen on this one? Well, it's a positive value, so it's moved to the right. Well, if I hit it here and this jump is too far, that could jump me to here, which is a positive value, and which way do we go? Well, I go to the right, so now I go to here, and that's a positive value, I keep going to the right, and what's happening to this value? It's now missed both, not only missed one root, it's missed both, okay, and as I continue this, this thing will continue, and it will just continue on forever for this particular function, okay, so this is what we call a divergent case. So one of the problems that you can have is for functions where roots are really close together, that if my guess isn't close enough, on here, say I'm way far out and this function has a real high value, it's possible to jump over both roots. And when that happens, then it's like it doesn't know that this exists. So, so that could be the case that we have for that one. Now, to fix that, the way I fix it is I could come in and let's try another guess that is pretty close to the root, a little bit closer. And now I could end up here, positive, move to the right, and then jump across. And now if I only jump across one of them, well, now it's negative, come back to the left, and now I can bounce back and forth and I can converge to this root. But what do you notice? This root I can't converge to because everything is completely opposite because if you look at the slope of the line in this general region, it's now a positive slope. So if I guessed here, I go to the left. If I guess here, I go to the right. You'll never find this root in the method uh, for this particular function. Okay, so that's one of the problems and one of the things you got to be careful with with some of these open methods is that there are situations that can occur in these simple algorithms that will cause us to have some issues. So we need to come up with a way to be able to basically what we need in this is I need if my value is negative, I need the ability to be able to move to the right, you know, depending on what the function is doing. So we've got to kind of tweak our algorithm, so to say, but the basics work. It works perfectly for a negative slope, which is what we were seeing here. Okay, it was just when the slope started going the other direction that we had a problem finding that root. All right, so let's see how we can tackle this. Okay, all right, so what we're looking is we're trying to find a place, you know, that will help us find that second root. Okay, so we're going to pick a point x naught on this. Okay, and so the general idea is, is that in all cases, 
except where x naught plus f of x naught is equal to the root one case, okay, the next guess will be further away. Okay, and that's what was the problem that we were having, and why was that? Okay, which feature of the graph causes this behavior? Okay, well, it, you know, as we've talked about, now we've cleaned up our, our divergent line kind of idea that if I guess here, we said positive value moved us here, okay, that it diverged, and then if it started out here, now it moves to the left, it was a diverging criteria. It diverges no matter what. Okay, so what happens is, is for this method, okay, what we defined was is that our next guess was equal to g of xi, okay, which was f of xi plus xi. Okay, that it will converge when an overall slope of fx, okay, is negative, but it tends to diverge when the slope of fx is positive. So what we need is we need something that factors in the, the slope of the line at the location, okay? And basically, the moral of the story is divergence is bad, that positive slopes, okay, for our, at our guess location will blow up this estimator, okay? You'll never find the route that you're after, so we've got to find the alternative method, okay? And basically, we want to find one that accounts for positive slope scenarios. And that's where a very common method known as the newton raphson iteration comes in, or the newton raphson method. This is a real popular one in, in, um, in engineering. Okay, so instead of assuming that xi is a root, as the previous method, we're going to assume that the function itself is linear between the root and xi. And we'll show you what that means here on some graphics. Okay, so let's take a look at a scenario. So the, the case that we're trying to solve is we need a scenario that solves the last problem with negative slopes, which this one will do, but we also want to be able to handle the positive slope. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to take an initial guess of x, x naught, and when I calculate this, we're going to calculate this as a negative value. Okay, and what we're going to assume is that there is a linear function that exists between this guy and the root that we're looking for. And so what we can do is we can say, well, let's define then the slope of this line for xr on here, that the slope of this line we know would then be the rise, which is just the value of f of x naught, divided by the difference between xr and x naught. Okay, so if the slope of the line here, f of x naught minus f of xr, divided by x naught minus xr, that's our rise over run formula. Okay, that we can rearrange this Okay, and say that, well, that's basically the same thing as f of x naught over x naught minus xr, okay, for this term, that that is, if you look at this function, that the value of the function divided by the distance, that's the slope of the line at that location, okay, that it's f prime of x naught, that this is a function that is linear between x naught and a root, okay. Now, Suppose that we don't know what the root is, this xr value, which is generally the case. Well, what we can do is we can write our equations in terms of the next guess that we're going to call as x1. So we're going to take f of x0 over x0 minus x1 is going to be equal to the slope of f prime over x0 and so forth and so on. And so if I rearrange this formula a little bit, what I can do is I can solve for my next guess, this x1 value. And the formula that you see is, is that x1 is going to be equal to x0 minus f of x0 all over f prime of x0. Okay, so we're going to take the, the value of the function at x0 over the slope of the function at x0. And it's this minus sign right here that solves the problem. Okay, and so what will happen is, is that we can write a general equation then. That, so the x1 guess is based off of x0. The x2 guess will be based off of x1s everywhere and so forth and so on. So the general form is that x of i plus 1, the next guess, is going to be equal to this guess minus f of xi, the value of the function at this guess, divided by the slope of the function at this guess. Okay, and if you look at it, now everything is based off of a point that I already have in my possession. So all I have to do is come up with the slope of the line at that. And so if we try it, let's try it. So now if I do an x naught here, I get a negative value of f of x. Okay, the slope to my root was a positive guy. So this term is a negative of a negative, which is a positive, which means that my x1 guess will be greater than my x naught. So now I've solved the problem, I'm now moving to the right. And you can see I've kind of labeled the arrows. And so I can do it again. X1 pulls me this value, and that's a negative value here, but the slope is positive, so that takes me this direction, and so forth and so on. Okay, and we can kind of keep, keep working that. Now, let's try a different guess. Let's try this one. 
Okay, so now I have my value. Again, it's still a positive slope line. Okay, my first guess is here. It's a positive value. So now we're doing my guess minus the value of the function, which is positive, over a positive slope. So now x of i minus a value. So I'm taking this, and the minus a value means that I'm moving now to the left. Okay, and so this comes down up to here, and then we come down, this is my next guess, and we iterate, and you can see now we're starting to converge no matter which side of the bracket that we end up on, and I solved that, the, that positive slope solution. So this is a very important point to note, and it solves a huge hurdle in root finding algorithms. Okay, so negative signs work, and negative slopes work really well, it's those positive ones that kind of tended to blow us up, so that's an important point to note. And if you're in my class, it's probably a good thing to make note of for a final exam question. Hint, hint. Okay, so here's what, so the way that we kind of look at it, and that's kind of the process that we showed is kind of, you know, that for x naught, if f of x naught is negative, and my f prime of x is positive, then x of i plus 1 is greater than x of i, meaning the next guess is to the right. Okay, and then if for the next, if for x1, if f of x1 is negative, and f prime of x one is positive, then again we're moving to the right. And then likewise we've talked about the left move and everything, so the next guess is to the left. So that's the, the power of the Newton-Raphson method. Okay, now let's double check to make sure that our method still works um, for our negative slope function, which we hope it does. Okay, so let's try it. So if my function is this guy, x of i plus 1 is equal to x of i minus f of x i divided by f prime of x i, that function hasn't changed, that now if I start here, now my f prime of x is a negative. Okay, so if I have a positive value for the function, then the numerator is positive, and I have a minus of a minus, it's still positive, so x of i plus 1 will be greater than x of i, and that still works. So now, even on the positive slopes, we're still moving toward the root. Okay, and then we'll check the other side just to make sure. So now I have a negative slope and a negative value, so that's minus and minus is a positive, so x of i minus this particular value is what we see happening there. So clearly, this is going to move to the left. It's a negative value here. Okay, so again, we, and, and for all, that, all these values, we will converge to that root location. Okay, now, it doesn't solve the problem that we had where we jumped too far. Okay, there's no way to avoid that. If you have two roots that are close together, it's still possible to miss one, but you will converge to the nearest root. Okay, and so that's what we have. Um, and so that's kind of where some of our, our problems that we have to face in this particular calculation. So remember in our bracketing methods, we talked about the slow convergence rate of the bracket method when I had very flat slopes. Okay, and so what will happen if this is my root and I look at, you know, my first guess, and this is a really high value and a really steep slope, well, if that f prime of x, if I pull this down a little bit, if this guy is really, really big, then your x your next guess will not be very far away from your first. And so if you hit a point on a really steep slope on this, then you'll move just a little bit, and this guy will be slow to converge to the root. It's moving in the right direction, but it's slow to do so. Okay, whereas if I'm down on one of these lower regions, and it's a very, very flat slope, I can start off with a guess that's really close and hit this guy, and that flat slope could throw me clear over here, and now I'm further away than I ever was when I started. So those are some, some issues when either the slopes are very, very large or the values of xi are very, very small. Those are all issues that can start to happen. Okay, all right. Another possible problem is has to do with inflection points. Okay, and by an inflection point, you know, the inflection points can confuse it. An inflection point in this case would be a value of a function that it, where it's equal to zero, where the slope is equal to zero. Okay, so maybe it's a, you know, a local minimum or a local maximum. This is not a root, but if I end up on this point, what can happen is, is that your algorithm can lock in on this maximum because, again, the function needed this guy, right? And so if my slope is a zero slope, on here, then all of a sudden this calculation can blow up and I can start bouncing around all over the place. Okay, the other problem that you have is, is that if, that, you know, that we can end up, you know, oscillating around an inflection point for a long time. So suppose I started out on a function that looks something kind of like this, and this is my first guess. Well, according to this, we come down, we take the slope that draws me all the way over to this point. Okay, great. You know, and then all of a sudden, but my root is over here. Well, we're going in the wrong direction, but now I hit this, and now I come back over here. Okay, and then I come down, and now I'm back over here. I mean, you can see how we're starting to kind of bounce around around this false location that is a root. Okay, 
a root location. So one of the things that you have to do when using the Newton-Raphson method is once you think you've converged on a value, if you can indeed converge to this value, okay, is, is that you have to make sure that you test the function value to make sure that it's not one of these false, you know, these, these, these false roots that can actually be picked up on these. Okay, okay, so we could end up oscillating around it, or if you hit one of these flat slopes, I could be thrown way far away, and then we're back to playing this game where we're kind of going in the wrong direction, and we're moving, but we're not converging anywhere near the root value that we have. Okay, okay. Now, what happens is it's possible that it could diverge, and, and this function can diverge sometimes, but not always. Okay, and part of it, it says, depending on your you know, on your guess, you could end up either closer or farther from the root, which is kind of what we saw. You know, if I took a, you know, if my x2 point was here, then my next guess would throw me over to here, and this is where my root was. So we're closer. But if my x2 is just a few digits away, and I ended up here, I could end up going in the wrong direction. So that's one of the, the drawbacks to this particular method by using the slopes, that it can throw you very quickly either toward the root, which is good news, or it can throw you in the wrong direction, which is generally pretty bad. Okay, so those are some of the things that we're looking at with the newton raphson method. All right, so let's give one a try and kind of show you kind of how we can start to set this up and start to work on newton raphson Like I say, this is a very important one in engineering. So what we want to do is we want to find an approximation to the function x equals square root of 5 and to be able to work on this. So the first step that we need to do is we need to write a function f of x such that x equals the square root of 5 is a root. Okay, now if I look at this, this function, we know that I could come in and say, well, one of the roots on this, I could write f of x is equal to x squared minus 5. Okay, well, that would be, that would give me a root of x equals the square root of 5. And in this case, then my f prime of x is going to be the first derivative of this, which is 2x. Okay. Now, if I look in, so we write our algorithm then, is that the, the next guess is going to be equal to the current guess minus the value of the current guess over the slope of the current guess. So my algorithm then becomes xn minus xn squared minus 5 over 2 times xn. Okay. Now, the, the general function that we're, that we're looking at, if we were to plot this, you know, this graph represents a plot of our function x squared minus 5. Okay, and we know that from our, you know, if I punch in my calculator, the root of 5 is somewhere between 2 and 2 and a half. Okay, so let's just, for the sake of argument, start with a guess of x naught equal to 2. Okay, so if I do x naught equal to 2, then my x1, my next guess, is going to be equal to 2 minus 2 squared minus 5 over 2 times 2. And so my next guess is going to be 2.25. Okay, so let's take that value and repeat the process and iterate again. So x1 is 2.25. So x2 then is going to be 2.25 minus 2.25 squared minus 5 divided by 2, divided, um, multiplied by 2.25. You can see all that written here. And the value becomes 2.36111111 repeating on this. Okay, if I repeat the process with x3, the, the 2.3611 repeating becomes 2.23606797779. You can check it, and if I use that to go to x4, you can see now, even on the fourth step, if you look, we're not moving anywhere except for the eighth decimal place at this point. And so pretty much you can say that the root of this guy is here, and it converges very, 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 very quickly. Okay, and so, so those are all the things that we're looking at. So on five steps, I'm at you know, eight or ten decimal places of convergence. You know, which for most of us, that's generally pretty good, depending on how accurate you need. But that's, that's good news for this particular methodology, to be able to lock in pretty quick. And it's all because you're taking advantage of not only the value of the function, but also the value of the slope, okay, to correct the directions. All right, so let's try another one. Let's try one that's a little bit harder. Let's find a solution of x equals cosine x. Okay, so we're going to write a function, f of x, okay, that has a root of x equals cosine x. Okay, well, if I do that, then f of x is going to be, will be x minus cosine x, okay, because again, what we're doing is we're taking this function and we're going to cast, we want to cast this thing into something that looks like f of x equals zero. So I can take all of the x stuff and put it on one side and set that equal to zero, that would be my function that I would be starting to iterate and starting to guess on. So this is my x minus cosine x, that's where this function comes from. We know that the cosine function looks something kind of like this. Okay, and I know that my f of x equals x line is this guy, so this point here, the point that where these two lines cross will solve that equation. That's the root of 
my polynomial here. So you can not, even, not only find roots, but you can also find where two functions intersect on an iterative basis, where those would where those would occur. So if we do f of x is equal to x minus cosine x, we take the first derivative of that function, it's now 1 plus sine of x, and now I just plug into my iteration formula. All right, so my, so this is what your formula looks like. It's going to be x in minus x in minus cosine of x in all over 1 plus sine of x in. Okay, no problem. So if we start the process with, you know, an initial guess of x naught equal to 1, Okay, when I do that, I get, and all I'm doing is I'm plugging in x naught of 1 into this, and then solving for x1. So if I plug into this formula with a value of 1, then my value x1 becomes 0 0.75036, and then if I plug, and then I repeat the process using this into the equation, my next guess is x2, 0.739, and then I plug in again, my next guess is uh, 0 0.739 again, with a, a little bit of error down in the you know fourth and fifth decimal places, and then again x4, and you can see this guy converged really in two steps. You had it to three decimal places, so it converges very very quickly um, for the value for where x is equal to the cosine of x. Okay, so really really easy process. The hardest part of this is coming up with a function that solves this guy. Okay, and a lot of times what it generally means is that you're going to set the function equal to zero and then pull all the x terms over to the other side. Okay, so I could just as easily have solved cosine of x minus x as I could have x minus the cosine of x. Whichever way you go doesn't matter on this particular process. Okay, all right. So I hope that's made some sense to you. As, um, like I say, the Newton-Raphson method is really, really powerful and a, and a good one to get, um, to, to, to get an understanding of and is especially useful in engineering applications and software calcs. Um, used by engineers all the time. I um, hope it's made sense. If you got any questions, as always, you can leave us some feedback in the comment section down below. That'd be great. We'll get back to you. Um, otherwise, if you found the video to be helpful, please toss us a like or subscribe to the video, and we will see you guys next time. Happy engineering.